We've got one for you. You will need it this morning because we are in Acts chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 6 through 11. Acts 1, 6 through 11. I'm going to read this to you. So follow along, if you will, in your Bible. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Oh, Father, thank you that you brought us to this passage of Scripture in our study of the book of Acts. On the day of the triumphal entry, the week before, Resurrection Sunday. Holy Spirit, again, I believe it's right where you want us to be. Because there's a message in here for us. You want to challenge us as a church. In the same way you challenge your disciples. You want us to have that same power with that same commissioning. So, Father, thank you for each person you've brought here today. Not here by mistake, here by divine appointment. So, Father, now, give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say, and we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in our last study, we talked about the power of the Christian life. And as I told you, Christianity is a religion of power. Nothing that God asks us to do makes sense without the power of God working in our lives. And we saw that the power of the Christian life is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are three very important things that Jesus lays out for us in this chapter. And that is that the foundation of the Christian life are the words and the commands of Jesus. The heart of the Christian life is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The power of the Christian life is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This leads us all to our study today where we have the purpose of the Christian life. And that is to be witnesses for him in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when you think about it, it's pretty simple and it makes sense, doesn't it? If the foundation of your life is the word of God, if the passion of your life is the resurrected Lord, if the dynamic power that drives your life is the Holy Spirit, then the natural result, or should I say the supernatural result, is that you're going to tell others about Jesus. You won't be able to help yourself. You're going to be a witness wherever you go. And that's exactly what happened to the early church, isn't it? As they were propelled out of Jerusalem, scattered throughout the Roman Empire, they went as witnesses for him. And they literally turned their world right side up. Now, Jesus introduces this concept of being witnesses through a question that was asked to him by his disciples. In verse 6, do you see it in your Bibles? They asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, if you've read the gospel accounts, you know that this was a question that was always on the minds of the disciples. 
not because of what it meant for the nation of Israel, because of what it could potentially mean for them. Now, now this is interesting because we, we can see so much of ourselves in the disciples right here. See, what they're basically trying to get at was this. Jesus, what's in this for me? And it was apparent to them now that Jesus really had come back from the dead. And I'm sure their minds were going wild with what the risen Lord could accomplish in his resurrected state. I mean, how great would it have been for Jesus to go show up in front of Pilate and say, I'm back. <laughs> I mean, the possibilities were endless. And the disciples knew that if Jesus overthrew the Roman government, established his kingdom, oh, they would be in great shape. One would sit on the right of Jesus and the other on the left. They would have positions of great authority and power. And so as they had done many times before, for selfish reasons, they questioned Jesus about his coming kingdom. Now what's sad about this is that there really was something for them in the kingdom that had come with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. With his death and resurrection, Jesus had established his kingdom, and his kingdom was available to all who would believe. And here's some of the benefits of that kingdom. As part of the kingdom of heaven, we have the power of binding and loosening things in heaven and on earth. With the kingdom comes righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. With the kingdom comes power. With the kingdom comes a future that cannot be shaken. Now, those are neat things, aren't they? So how do we gain access to this kingdom? Well, Jesus told the Pharisees that the kingdom does not come by observation, for indeed... The kingdom of God is within. In other words, God had established his kingdom within the hearts of those who believe. If you're a believer in Christ today, God has put his kingdom right inside of you. What that means is that every place you go, you take the kingdom of God with you. You can establish the kingdom of God in your workplace. You can establish the kingdom of God in your home. Think about that. You can bring the kingdom of God into your home. You can take the kingdom of God with you to the supermarket. Watch out, Safeway! <laughs> and with that, you bring his righteousness. It's okay, it's just coconuts falling on the roof <laughs> that my son-in-law will scavenge and eat later on. So with the kingdom, you bring righteousness, peace, his joy. With the kingdom of God, you bring his power into every situation. With this kingdom comes a solid foundation in the midst of the sinking sand of this world. People, this is powerful stuff. The kingdom was there for the disciples. But they weren't thinking about the kingdom in those terms. No, they wanted the authority and power and rule that would come if Jesus put down Rome and established his kingdom. So notice how Jesus answers them in verse 7. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has put into his own authority. Now, Jesus doesn't deny that there's a future fulfillment of his kingdom that is coming literally on this earth. We know that's going to happen. We know there's coming a day when the feet of Jesus Christ will touch down on the Mount of Olives. He will walk through the Kidron Valley. He will blast through that eastern gate in Jerusalem that's been sealed up. And the kingdom that's in our hearts will be extended out to the whole world. Jesus will sit on his father, King David's throne, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Folks, that's still to come. It's going to happen. But you say, well, well, when, Ricky, when? When? <laughs> when is Jesus going to turn and do this? Well, listen to his answer. He says, it's not for you, Kumalani, to know 
the times and the seasons that the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, we'll never be able to pinpoint the day of his coming. We'll never be able to fix a day, a week, a month, even a year for his return. And anyone who says they can is off the wall. Remember the guy who wrote 88 Reasons Why Jesus Must Come Back September 15th of 1988? Folks, he was wrong. Now, he sold lots of books. Same guy wrote 90 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come Back in 1990. And many of you bought the book again. The Jehovah's Witness predicted that the generation of 1914 would not pass away until a new order of lasting peace and true security was established on the earth. The masthead of every awake magazine proclaimed this prediction until they figured out it wasn't going to happen. They had to take it off. They realized the prediction was false. They had not been able to pinpoint the day or even the generation of his second coming. And no one can, and no one will. This is something that's in the Father's domain, the Father's domain early only. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 32. He said, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, pray, for you do not know when the time is. Now, what we can know are the signs of his coming. We can know those. In fact, Jesus gave us the signs of his coming so we'd not be caught unaware. He gave us this incredible description of what would be going on in our world right before he came back again so we'd be awake redeeming the time. But what he doesn't want us to do is to spend all of our time trying to put together world events, Bible prophecy, so we can pinpoint the day of his arrival. Now, he wants us to have a good idea where we are in the prophetic timetable. He wants us to have that. So we'll be motivated to be about his business. And so as we see the world events match, march up, and folks, are we not seeing that? Are you watching the news? Are you seeing what's happening in Russia and the Middle East and to Israel? Folks, get ready. Get ready. That should get us fired up to do what God wants us to do. But we shouldn't be consumed with Bible prophecy and world events. Did you get that? We should not be consumed with Bible prophecy and world events. Why? Because there's something more important that Jesus wants us to be consumed with. Look at verse 8. But you shall receive, what's the word? Power. Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The risen Savior, plus the Word of God, plus the power of the Holy Spirit equals believers who will be witnesses to Christ to the ends of the earth. People, this is the great purpose of the Christian life. This is why we're here. God saves us, he equips us, he empowers us so we can be his witnesses to the world. Now let me give you a little insight here. To the extent that this purpose is the passion of the church, there will be peace, joy, and unity in the church. But when this purpose is set aside, church can become a nightmare. You been there? I have. See, when the focus of the church is going after souls, when the passion of the church is to be the best witness it can to the, a lost and dying world, folks, nothing else matters. All the other issues just fade away. But when the church has lost this passion for souls, everything else matters. And everything else becomes an issue. And those issues will tear us apart. This is one of the things we see on mission trips. It's so wonderful. It's amazing how much junk you can put up with when people are getting saved. 
It's amazing how close people can get. When, even in the midst of horrible circumstances, when the goal is being a witness to the love and the grace and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Over and over on mission trips, I hear people say, I can't believe how good we're getting along. I can't believe how we're serving each other. This is wonderful. And the reason for that is that our focus is right. Our priorities are right. When you're consumed with being a witness, everything else falls into place. But when you're not focused on being a witness, we tear each other apart over what kind of carpet we have or what kind of chairs we sit in. It's interesting. When you're in the mission field, dirt floors and beach chairs work just fine. Focus of the church is so important. We've got to keep our eyes on this prize. This is our goal. Witnesses for him. Our great purpose is to be witnesses to our world. But people don't miss this. There's something that has to happen to us before we can be witnesses. There's something that has to happen to us before we can tell others about him. We have to receive his power by the epi experience of the Holy Spirit. Here's another one of those great biblical truths. God never sends us without first equipping us. Never. He never asks us to go without preparing us to go. The preparation for being a witness is the empowering that comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's think about this concept of being a witness to our world. For most of us, there's nothing more frightening than when the pastor starts talking about you being a witness for Christ. A little sweat starts dripping down your face. Your hands get clammy. I love it. <laughs> because it conjures up thoughts of preaching on the street in front of chemos, wearing a sandwich board that says, Jesus is coming soon, and boy, is he mad on one side, and I'm a fool for Christ who's fool for you on the other. <laughs> Some of you have done that, Lance. <laughs> you did it well. I'm telling you, you were good at it. It was amazing, okay? But that's not the only way to be a witness. In fact, you'd have to say that there are as many ways of being witness as there are people out there who need to be saved. You see, God is going to uniquely reach each and every person, and he'll reach them in a very unique way, and he wants to use you as part of that process. Plus, we need to understand that bringing a person to Christ is not one person's responsibility. Moms, are you listening? It's not one person's responsibility. God's going to use a whole group of us to accomplish what he wants in a person's life. This is how Paul put this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. See, what Paul is saying here, is that there are many components that go into leading a person to Christ. And each one of us might play a different role in that process. My friend Danny Lehman from YWAM likes to think of it this way. Every day he goes out, he puts on his gospel belt that holds his witnessing tools. On that belt, he has a bag full of seeds. There's a tracks that he gives out to sow the seeds of the gospel into people's lives. He also has a watering can that he uses to water those seeds. He has a trowel that he uses to break up the hard ground and to dig out the weeds that are choking out the growth of the good seeds. And he also has a sickle that he uses to get the harvest of the fruit that is ripe. And in some people's lives, all that Danny is doing is he's just sowing the seeds of the gospel, just putting out those seeds. And see, some people just have a knack for doing this. You know, they can talk to people about God's love for them and God's plan for their lives and throw in a principle that's, that's, that's relevant for what they're going through. And all the time, they're just sowing seeds into people's lives. In other people's lives, Danny's watering seeds that have already been put in. 
You know, and it's such a wonderful and fun thing to water the seeds that have already been planted. And one of the things I really like to do are water the seeds that you guys plant all over the place. In Santa Barbara, there's a gal after church went down to town and she's in a business and she ended up talking with the business owner and actually gave him a track and witnessed with him. He wasn't ready to receive Christ, but she sowed some good seeds. Well, I was downtown th that next week and I went by the shop and I said, I'm going to go in and water those seeds. So I went in. Hey, where's the owner? Came out, introduced myself to him. See, it's pretty simple. Talked to him about that gal. Asked him if he'd read the track. He had. Talked about the track. Invited him to church. You see, I was watering his seeds and he didn't even know it. So good. Now with the trowel, it's kind of a twofold thing. The first, it's used for digging up the weeds that the enemy's going to sow into people's lives that would choke out the good seeds of the gospel. And secondly, it's used to break up that stony ground in people's hearts. And again, you know, this is as simple as addressing some of the weird ideas that people have about God or about church or about Christians or whatever. And this is so important because, see, the weeds will sometimes grow faster than the good seeds. Have you noticed that in people's lives? In fact, sometimes you look at your friends, all you see are the weeds, right? So sometimes you've got to dig in there, get those weeds out. As you do, you find, ah, oh, the seeds of the gospel, they're still in here, okay? Don't get discouraged. Now, with a sickle, you get to get the harvest, you get to lead a person in the kingdom. So you see, the word has gone out. It's been watered. The weeds have been dug up and pulled away. The plant grows. The fruit is white, ripe. And then you get to come in, and you get to get the harvest. And this is the most exciting time of all. Folks, there's nothing like leading a person to Christ. There's nothing like seeing one of your friends or family come into the kingdom of God to discover that they're sinners and that Christ died on the cross for them and to receive the forgiveness of their sin and to open their heart up and ask Jesus to come in and to see him be born again right in front of you. There's nothing more exciting. It's the greatest thing you'll ever do. And see, part of being a witness is knowing when that person is ready for that, when they're ready for the harvest. And here's how we find out. We ask them. <laughs> See, we're, we're kind of testing the fruit. And you've got to ask them if they're ready to receive Christ in their life right now. You know, so often I'll be talking to someone after church, and, and we've given an altar call, and, and I'll say, hey, did you respond to the altar call today? Did you give your heart to Jesus? Oh, Pastor, I wanted to so bad, but you're scary going up front, and oh, I didn't know what people would think, and oh, I didn't do it. I said, well, you know what? We can do it right here, right now. I can lead you in this prayer right now to receive Christ. You want to do it? And so often, they say, yeah, Pastor, I'd, I'd like to do that. Now, sometimes you ask a person, and they say, no way, I'm going to brunch. Get away from me. <laughs> I've had enough of you for the day. And, you know, and that's the problem. You know, we get scared to ask people because sometimes they might say no, and it's uncomfortable. In fact, you're pushing people up against the wall, you know, making push them for a decision. And so we don't ask. But you know, sometimes you ask and people say yes. Can I tell you what happened to me? I went to a, a meeting one night. Never been to a Christian meeting before. At the end of the meeting, they asked if people were interested. And I was. I went up and th this kid, he, you know, we're both in high school. This kid read me the four spiritual laws. At the end of the four spiritual laws, there's a question. Is there any reason why you wouldn't want to invite Christ into your life right now? He looked at me, and I said, not that I could think of. He said, no way! We've got a winner! <laughs> Luckily, there was one more page. <laughs> and he led me in that prayer that's in the back of the four spiritual laws. But you see, he asked. He asked me the question. And this is part of the harvest, asking people the question. So do you see how those all fit together? Do you see how they fit together to make us witnesses for Christ? You may see in this whole process, your strong point is sowing the seeds of the gospel in people. That's wonderful. For others, your strong point is you can come alongside, you can water those seeds. You can encourage them. 
Others, you use the trowel. Maybe you like wax or tipton. You're an apologist. You can dig out those weeds. You can soften up that stony ground. Hey, maybe you're like Augie and Stephanie. You guys are the closers. Right? That's why I bring Augie in. I want the closer. Right? Hey, he's just got a boldness to ask people, have you ever received Christ? And he uses a sickle. So once you figure out what your strong point is, then use that. Concentrate on that. Use that to be a witness. Then at the same time, you should be trying to stretch yourself in the weak areas of your witnessing. There, there's a guy in our church in Santa Barbara who was a great planter and a great waterer. I mean, this guy was something else. Well, every person he talked to, he had a spiritual conversation with, planted lots of seeds, but he, he, he just he couldn't lead people to Christ. He just was uncomfortable with that. So he'd get them all teed up, bring them to church. I'd give the altar call. The guy would come up, or the gal would come up, and they'd get saved. And one morning, he had one. He brought them to church, and they were ready to go. And they walked in. They knew people, and they were comfortable. And the praise and worship started, and he could see God was touching them. And we get to the end of the service, and I didn't give an altar call. So afterwards, this guy comes up, and he's mad. He's mad at me. He's ticked <laughs> off. You didn't get right at this guy. I said, well, go get him. Bring him in. Come on. Bring him in. So he gets this guy, brings him in, and when he comes up, I said, hey, I'm so glad you're here today. You know your friend that brought you to church? He's got a question he wants to <laughs> ask you about your relationship with Jesus. This brother gave me stink eye like you have never seen. I'm telling you, if looks could kill, I would have been dead on the spot. But the guy was brave. He asked the guy the question. Listen, I'll never, listen, I'll never forget this guy's answer. He says, is there any reason you want to re receive Christ in your life? The guy said, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. And he led him to the Lord right there. He's been leading people to Christ ever since. So use your strong points. But keep working on your weak points. Grow in your ability to be a witness for Jesus. Now, let's look at the extent of our witness. We are to witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we usually think of this as being a call to take the gospel out from our city to our state to our country and then to the uttermost parts of the world. And there's no doubt, that's, that's the call here. That's what this is. The scope of this is huge. It's big. But we can also make it personal, can't we? We could say the scope of our witness could be our immediate family, our neighborhood, our business community, and then to our city as a whole. You see, however you look at this, what you get the picture of here is that Jesus wants our witness to go out in concentric circles from our lives. And he wants our witness and the influence of our witness to be constantly expanding. It's not good enough for us just to be good witnesses to our families. We have to be thinking of being good witnesses on West Maui. It's not enough just to have vision for our island, for Christ. But we have to have a witness for all of Hawaii Nei. And beyond that, maybe even to the South Pacific. And ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth. And, and you see, folks, even our little church here on Maui, we've got to have a vision to get the gospel out to the uttermost parts of the earth. And many of you do, and it's exciting. A little side note here. Chuck Smith says that one of the reasons that the Calvary Chapel movement has been so successful is that we have this strong sense of sending out churches to reach our Judeas, our Samarias, our uttermost parts of the world. But as we do, these new churches that are started, they become their own Jerusalem. And then they, in turn, reach out to their Judeas, their Samarias, and their uttermost parts of the world. For example, we now have churches in Siberia. Folks, that's the uttermost part of the world. I mean, that's it, right? That's just as far as you can go. Siberia. We've got a number of churches there. But you see, that for them has become their Jerusalem. Now they're reaching out to their Judea. I don't even know where that is. <laughs> but they do, and they're going for it. Okay? So it becomes like sparks to jump out and catch fire. And the sparks jump off of that and catch fire. And more sparks jump off of that and catch fire. That's been the success of our movement. But bring this back down to a personal level. You see, you, you have to understand that wherever you go, Wherever you are, that's your Jerusalem. Maybe you're here on Maui just for a, a while, just for a season, maybe just even for a couple of weeks. That's okay. 
while you're here, make this your Jerusalem. See, what that does, it keeps the mission field right in front of us all the time. And that's what Jesus wants, which was emphasized by the two angels. Look at verses 9 through 11 in your Bibles. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, Jesus was taken up in a cloud, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This is so great, because can't you just see the disciples here? I mean, the, Jesus is going up into heaven. They're going, wow, this is awesome. And they're gazing. They're thinking, this will be cool. We'll build a church right here. We'll call it the Church of the Ascended Lord. People will flock to it and come. So the angels show up there, and they remind them, and notice, a uh, not-so-gentle way, guys, what are you staring at? <laughs> what are you looking at? Don't worry about where Jesus went. You go and do what he's called you to do until he returns again. That's what this is all about. And people, that is what this is all about. Jesus is coming back soon. Do you believe that? He's coming back. We need to be about his business. We need to be concentrating on what he wants us to do, and that is to be his witnesses in our world. So here's the question for you this morning. Here's the question. Are you fulfilling the call that Jesus has placed upon your life? Are you being his witness in your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Sumeria, and the uttermost parts of the world? Or have you been content to leave that job to someone else? If you have, then you've got to realize that there are people out there that will never hear, or at least they'll never hear it like they should because they can only hear it from you. There are people that will slip into eternity without Christ because we're not willing to receive God's power and then go. See, maybe what we need to do is we need to strap on that gospel belt Ooh. and start sowing some seeds. And folks, I can't think of a better week to do that than the week that we are in. Folks, this is the week of weeks. This is it. It's the week of weeks. This is when people are going to be thinking about Jesus and your friends. They're going to want to go to church someplace. You know, we're going to have 100,000 visitors on our island this week. And most of them are looking for a place to go to church on Easter Sunday. They're looking for it. I want them to come here. I want them to hear the gospel. Okay? Uh, you have friends around you. You know, and they're saying, you know, I've just been waiting for you to ask. And I know some of your friends, you say, I ask them every year. They never come. But you see, every time you ask them, more water on the seeds, more water on the seeds, more water. You know, a little troweling, you know. Hey, maybe this is the year. Maybe this is the year that they walk through these doors. No doors, of course. It's even better. They walk through these doors, and this is the year they hear the gospel, and they respond to it. You see, our job is to sow the seeds, water the seed. And so what we've got, we've got the, the coolest thing for you guys. We've got these little rave cards, and they're so perfect because they're not too big. They're not too small. They're just right. <laughs> and you give them to your friends, and you say, I, I want to invite you to come to our Easter service. Hey, we got two. We do a sunrise service, conveniently placed at 6.30. <laughs> they will appreciate that. And then, if you miss that, and you probably will, just keep coming <laughs> towards church, and you'll be here at 9.30 for our second one. And by the way, we're going to stuff you full of donuts from Krispy Kreme. <laughs> Folks, it's irresistible, I'm telling you. They won't be able to resist. So grab these. And then once you grab them, I want you to prayerfully consider who you'll give these out to. And then pray for those people. You know, it'd be cool. It'd be great if all of us gave these out to five or ten people this week. 
And then we as a church prayed for those five or ten people all week long leading up to Sunday morning. And then Sunday morning we saw an amazing harvest for the kingdom of God. Wouldn't that be great? Father, I, I thank you that there's only one thing we can do on earth that we can't do in heaven, or at least do it better in heaven. And that is to tell someone about Jesus Christ and to watch them get born again. That's our calling. That's our job. And Lord, I, I know it's, it's the scariest thing for some of us. And yet, it is the purpose of your church. It's the purpose of each individual living stone that makes up your church. That we be part of this process. Sowing, watering, troweling, putting in the sickle for the harvest. Well, that's what you want us to be about. And Lord, I think about in the book of Acts how... The church was being persecuted. They told them, don't, don't you guys talk about Jesus anymore. And that's a lot like our world today, isn't it? They said, don't you guys talk about Jesus anymore. But while they're waiting there, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And the building was shaken mightily. And the disciples received power to proclaim the word of God. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you come and shake this place today? Oh, God. Could you shake each life here? And would you empower us to be about your business? We may not have another Easter. But, Lord, while we've got this one, let us be about your business. Give us the boldness to be witnesses for you. Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand together.